and in the future on these Memorial and Labor Day weekends, uh, we're going to uh, go to just one service on those weekends in the morning. But uh, thank you for being here at 10 o'clock this morning. I want to make it worth your while. I, I knew as my phone began to ring over the weekend that we would have uh, not a lot of folks here for the first service this morning. And, and I thought as I was finishing my preparations this morning, uh, sometimes these uh, type services are more important because <clears throat> how many of you still trust God? Do you trust God? I think the ultimate test is the test of trust. Um, the ultimate measure of peace, you, may, you can't have peace without trust. Uh, and so uh, I, I trust him. And uh, I, I want to grow my trust in him. And I want to learn how to serve him better. And I, 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 I'm going to put all this together in a minute. But you know how I serve him better? By serving you better. I serve him better by being kinder to you. I serve him better by being there when you need me because that's how the love of Christ is displayed in the world. I don't serve him better by maybe going to church more often, although I think we all should do that. I don't serve him better by by uh, uh, giving more, although I think we could all probably to do it, could afford to do a little better there. But I serve him better by serving others better. And that's the way he served when he was on this earth. And so what I'm going to attempt to do today is talk about something that I, uh, in psychology, when I, as a freshman in college, I, I, we, I went to a psychology class and I've heard pastors say and preachers say that psychology and philosophy are, are bad things. And maybe they are, I think it's probably according to who teaches the class, but my psychology professor was a very smart man and his job was to make you think and uh, I think sometimes a pastor his job is is to make you think to, to make you observe things find find a situation and walk all around it and look at it from every angle and uh, and so I'm going to attempt to do that today and I'm just gonna I, I, I've adapted something that we did way back then and I'm simply going to call it this morning the love test the love test, and uh, I'm a little challenged by it, and I think you will be uh, if we'll dig deep in it this morning. I think we'll all be challenged by it, and you can apply this test to everything. You can apply this test to your dog, Peaches, or whatever his name is. You can apply this test to your children. You can apply this test to your parents. You can apply this test, and I know you're going to pass it when you apply it to your pastor. You can apply this test to anybody you work with this is a test that can be applied and and you can find out i think scripturally whether or not you actually love someone let's read some scriptures about it in romans chapter number 12 and uh we're going to start with verse number nine and everybody the first thing that we've got to understand that everybody has to understand about love is it almost goes without saying, but it's got to be said. It's got to be sincere. I love you, man. Well, that, you know, that's not really sincere. But love's got to come from way down, and it's got to become a part of the fabric of we, who we are. If love never fails, according to First Corinthians, and we'll read that, then what we've got to do in order for us to be together for the long haul and for us to make it to heaven together, what we've got to do is we've got to develop love, sincere, original love. We can't let the world mess with the definition. We've got to strictly scripturally define it, and we've got to get it in our heart. Hey, elbow your neighbor and say, hey, I love you, man or woman or whatever, and uh, uh, tell somebody, hug somebody's neck real quick, shake somebody's hand. Tell them you love them, and let's get ready to get into the word of the Lord. I love you, Brother Marty. love you, Brent. Amen. Romans chapter 12, verse number 9. Love, let love be without hypocrisy. And everybody say amen real loud. Because I just almost don't know love like that. The love of the world is, is conditional love. 
the love of the world is, is if everything goes all right. And if we just stopped right there and we didn't read another scripture, we didn't do anything else, if we just said that and we went home and we dwelt on that for the next few days, that would make us better people. Let my love, now you think about how other people treat you, but let's think about how you treat other people. When I get through this morning, you're going to be thinking, I promise you, let love be without hypocrisy. What is hypocrisy? You love me this way, and I don't want to love you back the same way. You, I expect it from you, but I do not expect to give it myself. Abhor what is evil, cling to what's good. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love in honor and giving preference to one. Uh, uh, when there's just, I had two brothers, and I loved them unless there was just one piece of chicken left on the plate. But if it was just one piece of chicken, my mother loved my dad because she would make a coconut pie, and she would cut half the pie, and she would give him the half, and the rest of us, we would split the other half. That's the way she did it. My mother would rather her kids eat than her eat. She would make sure that we were taken care of before she was taken care of. So I, I watched affectionate, kindly affectionate love giving preference to somebody else. I watched that in my mother. My mother would have never gla- grabbed the last piece of chicken, never. But I'd stab my brothers in the back of the hand with a fork if they went for it. Or Danny would pick up every piece of chicken and lick it. That way he knew he could eat it all. That really did happen one time. Verse number 11. Not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit. My goodness. Serving. We, wow, that's how we serve the Lord. Let's go on. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer. Distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Somebody say amen. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Now, let me just say something. How many of you love the Word of God? But let's say there wasn't any Bible. You didn't have any Scripture. There wasn't any Genesis and there wasn't any Revelation. But you just had these seven verses. You'd be a better person, wouldn't you? If you just had these seven verses. Now, I'm going to read them again quickly. And and when I start, you got to catch me. If you're having trouble in your relationships today, I'm going to help you if you'll listen. Let love be without hypocrisy. Don't expect something you're not willing to give. Abhor what is evil, cling to what's good. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love. In honor, giving preference to one another. Not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfast, that means praying for one another, distributing to the needs of the saints, giving a hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble Do not be wise in your own opinion. Oh, my goodness, what a passage of Scripture. Oh, my goodness. I read it probably 30 times in this morning, just like, oh, my goodness, what do we do with that? Because I promise you, you, there's some fine folks in here today. Some of you chose to be faithful on this holiday weekend. There's some fine folks in this room right now, but I will guarantee you we all could do better when it comes to those seven verses. Everybody in the house. God bless you. You may be seated. Thank you for standing. There are three themes in the scripture, and you always look. They're always found together. Unity and service and love. You can't, the only way to have unity in the body of Christ is to serve one another. What we did at this funeral for for uh, uh, this young Baker girl that, that 
had such a tragedy and lost her life. What we did for that family was we, we created unity. You can't imagine the phone calls I've gotten. Pastor, your church just showed out. You, I can't believe the people that took off work, the, from, from the folks that served the food to the folks that played the instruments and sang the songs to the folks that ushered at the door. To the, I can't believe the folks that served people you didn't even know. You didn't know their name. You didn't know. You just served them because it, you felt it in your heart that it was the right thing to do. And you know what? That's created so much unity. All, I've had people, businessmen in town say, Pastor, I've just never seen. That's an old-fashioned church that does that. That's, an old, that, that's the way it used to be. And I've had many of them say, hey, we're, I've had several families say, we're gone this weekend, but the next weekend we're going to come and we're going to visit you. We have a home church, but it's not like this one. I've heard that all week long. Well, I said, I knew that before you said it. Uh, I also heard something the other day, and I, I'm going to tell you something. You want to you wanna pattern your, and I know she gets paid, but she'd do it if she didn't get paid. You want to pattern your life of service after somebody, you watch Regina Fields. She gets her kicks from serving other people. That's a good way to live, isn't it? And, and because of that, I don't know anybody that doesn't like her. If you don't like her, you're just weird. You need prayer. It's Kayla's the only one in here. But we, I didn't know she was here. I wouldn't have said that. She's back there. I thought she was out serving somebody. But what you do when you create, as, as Regina has served different ones of you, it creates unity between you and her. That's what service does. It creates unity. And unity creates love. And so you see, sir, unity and service and love are always tied together because without unity, there can't be service. And without service, there can't be love. And without love, there can't be unity. And without unity, there can't. So you see how that just all rolls in together. And so we've got to tie. The, so if you feel something towards someone, serve them. You will begin to feel the unity of the body. I can tell you something, fellas. It's an old-fashioned trick, and I'm a pro at it because I may be the biggest jerk I know, but when I get in a little squabble with my wife, and I know you find that's hard to believe that I actually would do that, I know where her little favorite stores are, and I can stop by and I can spend $20 on a little gift, and it makes a big difference. And she knows I'm buying her off, but she still likes it anyway. Because I decided, you know, instead of fussing, I think I'm going to serve a little bit. Instead of fussing, I think I'm going to do something kind. And if you'll just shut your mouth and do something kind, it's amazing how quick that love feeling comes back. Pretty good preaching right there. And I said this, and I kind of keep saying it, being right is way overrated. Being unified is much more important. And so let's get into it. So if you serve somebody, you're going to begin to feel unified with them. And if you become uh, in unity with them, you fall in love with him. And Paul said, love must be sincere. It must be genuine. And in our society, it is such a slippery term. Love is so ill-defined it's used to cover the basest of human instincts love is defined as lust love is defined as as sexual interest love is defined as as entertainment love is defined at all sorts of things but it's not defined that way in the bible in the bible love is the thing of everyday living in love in the bible love is the thing that perpetuates Christianity. In the Bible, love is the basic bread and butter, nuts and bolts of who we are and what we do. It is our daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. And part of our daily sustenance is love for one another. And I am a professional at measuring your love for me. And we are all that way. But we must become professionals at measuring our love for others. Because when we increase our service to others and our unity with others, then that love is going to grow. And I have got to measure my love 
for others. Where do I fall short? Where am I missing the boat? Instead of how come they don't love me like they're supposed to? How come they don't treat me right? And I, I sat with a pastor of 43 years in, in, uh, uh, in Charlotte, North Carolina this week. He was a black brother, and he, pa- he pastored for 43 years. And, and uh, uh, we were sitting with another gentleman that, had, that had, uh, was in, uh, been in business for a long time, and these two men uh, were the same age. They were both 66 years old, and, and we sat and we talked for a while. And this old bishop was just so full of wisdom. And he sort of began to counsel the man I was with about a situation they were going through. And he said, in the ministry, you're going to have your heart broke a thousand times. And he said, and that's where this all came from, he said, but the challenge and my challenge as a 66-year-old man is to continue to serve and it's to continue to love because I spend, and this is what he said, I measure their kindness and their affection and their love to me, but what I really ought to measure is my kindness and my affection and my love to them. That's the real test. And that that sounds a little shallow, but when you really think about it, that drives the shovel pretty deep. We're all selfish by nature. Unless we love somebody. My mother was never selfish when it came to her children because she loved them. She was willing to sacrifice for her children because she had a natural love. We're all naturally selfish unless we love somebody. And if we love somebody, then we will prefer them before ourselves. That's just the way it is. So the question is, how do we know? How do we know we love somebody? So if it's our sustenance, if it's the identity of a Christian, by my, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples, that you have love one for another. If it's we've got to measure ourselves, not others, by our love meter. We need a not a mood ring, but a love ring. Here we go. Here we go. So love test question number one, and they get better as we go, so I started out a little easy. And this sounds kind of, I don't know how, I, I tried to word it better, but it sounds a little cheesy, but it's got some meaning to it. Do I show real devotion to other people? What does that mean? What does that mean? Am I willing to set my schedule aside when somebody needs me? Am I am I willing to consider the wants and needs of others before my wants and my needs? If I had a hundred dollars in my pocket, would I buy my wife a dress or would I buy me a new fishing pole? There's no doubt about it, you'd buy a fishing pole, wouldn't you? And we're going to come back to that in a minute because that, but really all of this sort of, sort of fits into that question, number one, as we dig in a little bit. Number two, do I honor others? There's nothing. Come, let's be honest. There's nothing you like better than somebody saying, "You sure a nice fella? Or you sure do look pretty today? Or I sure do love you." Uh, you sure did preach good today, Brother Whitley. We like that. You can't help it. It's natural. My wife paid me a compliment in the office a while ago, and she said that I sure did look handsome today. And uh, she was right. And I said, well, you look beautiful. She said, well, I had to tell you that so you'd tell me I look beautiful. She was teasing, of course, but sometimes we, we, we've all fished for a compliment, hadn't we? But if we really love someone, you know what we're, we ought to be doing? 
we ought to be fishing for opportunities to give compliments. You try that on for size and see if that don't work. You become completely uh, a complete nerd in the compliment department. You come, you become so, so cheesy and so gooey and so syrupy sweet that you make other people sick. Your spouse will like that. That's real good preaching. It's real quiet, but that's real good. Do I honor others? Do I compliment others? Am I more eager for their advancement than my own? Uh Uh-oh. Would I rather someone else be blessed than me? And that's a tough one. If I really love them, I will promise you, I have in a couple of times in my life, I have the, the most strange relationships I've ever been around in, 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 as a pastor for almost 25 years now is that sometimes I have seen parents that were jealous of the success of their children, and that's crazy. But if you love your children, how many of you love your kids? You want them all to be presidents. You want them all to be billionaires. You want them all to, if you love your kids, you, the the ultimate, you, you want them to succeed on on every level in their walk with God, in their finances and, and, and how they're viewed by the community. You're proud. The glory of fathers, Solomon said, the wisest men that ever lived said, the glory of fathers are their children. Hey, that's my boy, my girl. You want to be proud, and that's you honor them. You're eager for their advancement because you love your kids. Can you treat someone else just like that? Because it's easy to love your kids. It's not. It, it's not a mark of Christianity to love your children. Everybody loves their kids unless they're just completely crazy. I've seen a few completely crazy people, but ninety nine percent of people love their kids. It's not a mark of Christianity, but if you could treat somebody else, if I could treat Brandy like I would treat my own daughter, then I have really become the mark of a Christian. And let me get right down where we live. If I can treat my stepchildren like I treat my children. My dad was good. My dad used to make me mad, but... I felt like I was the best baseball player on my team, but my dad would make sure that everybody, even though I felt like I was as good and maybe better than most of them, my dad wanted to make sure everybody got an opportunity to play. It made me mad at him sometimes, but I watched him live that example. He didn't prefer his children. My His boy wasn't going to be quarterback unless he deserved to be quarterback. His boy wasn't going to be point guard unless he deserved that right to be point. And that's really loving other people. I put something, I don't ever post anything on Facebook, but I posted something about my dad. This past week, my dad turned 73 years old. And I just said, I just thank God that I can call my dad, and, and my dad has a word of wisdom for me, and a happy birthday, Pop. And, and I had so many comments from folks that he taught in Sunday school 30 years ago, 40 years ago, that they knew that back then that, he loved them. He took them fishing for the first time. He took them camping. I remember waking up in my house. We lived down in Haskell, and there'd be young people just sleeping all over the floor. You couldn't get to the bathroom. It was like running the gauntlet. And that's loving, folks. It's opening your house. It's feeding them your bread. And so let's be eager for their advancement. Let's be eager for the advancement of our young people. Hey, they may sing and they may not sing as pretty as you think they ought to sing, but let's be eager to see them advance. Let's not get disappointed when when someone else is doing good. Nathan did a great job last Sunday morning. He was so nervous he could barely stand up, but he did a great job. He had a good thought, and he kept his thought, and he finished his thought. And I talked. I said, you did good, Nathan, and you'll do better every time. He said, well, I just went off my notes. I said, yeah, you went off your notes. I did. I've already gone off my notes this morning. It's just going to happen, but you came back. You did good, and every time you'll do better. And there's somebody sitting in here who says, I, he don't need to be there. I need to be there, and that's the wrong attitude. You don't love him. Wow. So, that's number two. Number one, do I show real devotion? Number two, do I honor? And am I more eager for their advancement than my own? Number three. Uh, 
and went down the wrong pipe. Do I share? I'm afraid that maybe Jay doesn't love her brothers and sisters <coughs> as much as she should. Do I share? <coughs> Do I share? <coughs> Don't <coughs> one of the best things in the universe is the 12 piece chicken nugget at Chick fil A. Can I get a witness on that? Just one of the best foods in the world, and there's only 12 of them. That's the biggest one they serve. And I had one of those the other day. <clears throat> and Seth said, Dad, can I have one of those? I mean, there are just so few of them. <laughs> Eat your own dumb food and stay out of mine. But because it was Seth, I said, yeah, you can have one. He didn't need it, but he wanted it. But what if somebody's really in need? Well, I just barely got enough, but what if they're really in need and it's their own fault? I don't think that really matters. I think we should share. I think we should share. Brock's here this morning. I've seen Brock share. Brock's a blessed young man. Brock makes more money than most young men, about any young man his age. Brock's been blessed, but I've seen Brock take half of what he had in the bank and give it away. And his blessings just keep growing. And I told him and Chanley the other day, I said, you guys can conquer the world if you ever get your head screwed on straight. Because they've got that attitude that I want to. And because of that, I don't know anybody that doesn't like Brock because he's going to help you if he can. So I want to share. I want to share. Everybody say, I want to share. And this is a big one. <laughs> And I'm going to get down, I'm going to touch on this. i got to hurry, though, because i got eight of these, and I'm only on number four. Do I welcome other people into my home and into my life? Used to. We did that a lot more than we do now. I think the Christian trend in churches today is towards home fellowship, and I like that. Some of you may be, well, I know we need to have church services, but I, I think you need to call some folks at church and invite them over to your house. And by the way, when you get invited over to somebody's house, don't walk around and see what you can criticize. You've done it. I'm, I, I can't help it. i got to do this. You've all went to the restroom and opened their medicine cabinet to see what they were taking, didn't you? You saw that commercial, didn't you, where the, all the, they opened the medicine cabinet and all the medicine fell out and made a big noise? <laughs> but do I welcome others into my home? Do I welcome others into my life? Am I constantly looking for new friends? Am I looking at a way that I can be more of service to more people? Do I rejoice, number five, do I rejoice with those who rejoice? Or do I get mad when somebody else is blessed? Do I mourn with those who mourn? Or do I say, you got what you deserved? And we've all said it one time or another. No matter whether they're mourning because they brought it on themselves or mourning because of some tragedy, do I mourn with those who mourn? Do I rejoice with those who rejoice? <clears throat> and here, number seven, this is the big one. Do I live in harmony with others, or am I always looking for a fight? And we're all going to say this. It's according to how we feel that day. It's not about how you feel or what kind of mood you're in. Or how much money you got in the bank or what happened before you had this meeting. Am I willing to try to live in harmony with other people? i got to understand the more I understand about you, the easier it is to live in harmony. If you, you say some things that might, might, might strike me wrong, but the more I know about your background and the more I know, then I'm gonna, the more I, I strive to serve you, the more I'm going to be willing to tolerate things that I normally wouldn't tolerate because 
I'm trying to love you. And the same things from me. I, 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 uh, you, you, you hear me two or three times a week. You hear me in the pulpit. You know my personality. You get to know me because I'm the one that's always doing the talking. And it's easy for you to criticize the preacher because he's the one that talks all the time. But are you willing to live in harmony even though you may or may not agree? And this is the big one, and I think this is the test, the test, the test. This is the Samaritan test. And if you don't hear anything else, you hear this because this is how you build a church. Do I associate as equals with people who are socially or in any other way beneath me? Do I treat someone as an equal who may not, who might be a different color than I am? And let me say this. I'm not just talking about white folks and black folks. Black folks are prejudiced. White folks are prejudiced. Mexican-Americans are prejudiced. Everybody, uh, uh, it's denominational people are prejudiced against other people. We look down. We don't think they meet the mark. And you may think, well, I know this and you don't know this. And if you treat them like that, they'll know it. Try going and telling everybody they're going to hell that don't believe just exactly like you believe and sell me and come to church with you. But if I'll treat them as an equal and if I'll listen to them, I promise you, you can learn from everybody you meet. You can learn something from everybody you need. And if you'll treat them as equals, guess what? Your knowledge is going to grow. Their knowledge is going to grow. If you want them to learn what you learn, if you want them to learn what you know, why don't you learn what they know? Why don't you listen to them? You know, too many of us, and we've all been, too many of us like the sound of our own voice. We all just got to shut up and listen a little better. And I want to treat people with autism or Down syndrome or drug addiction or financial crisis. You know, there's a subculture of people out there that feel completely left out of society. For five years, I traveled in a subculture of sick people. And we try to push it behind us. We try to don't pay any attention. But every Tuesday morning, I showed up at the chemotherapy room, and there were literally hundreds of sick people, dying people sitting in there that had separated themselves from society, and they were just they were existing to fight a disease. They were too sick to go to church, too sick. They, they were just completely separated from society. I'm going to tell you, there's a giant ministry in these subcultures. There's a subculture of addicts that feel like they've been so, they're such losers, and they're so down on themselves that they don't think anybody else would care for them. But if you'd care for them, you'd win them all. There's a subculture of autistic people that, that you don't want to come to church because a little autistic boy might cry out in the middle of the song or in the middle of the sermon and just, who cares? We've got to show those folks we love them. There's all sorts of these subcultures of people that feel unimportant. There's all sorts of subcultures of people that feel separated from society, that feel alienated, that don't feel like they belong anywhere. And if you will treat that person as an equal, you have a friend for the rest of your life. And I got a friend. He's a great friend today. And I'll tell you the story, and he'd tell you if he is here, he may come in here at 11 o'clock. But... Uh, when I was a kid, growing up in school, I was the little Pentecostal boy, and I, I wore the little penny loafers and the polyester, and everybody else had the bell bottom and the peace patches and the, the hair down to the back, and I had a little. So I was different, and, and I got sort of picked on for that. So my heart went out to other people that didn't fit. And there was this little boy in my school, and he was just a fat, 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 fat kid. I'm talking about this kid was, he weighed three times as much as I weighed. He's just a big old fat kid. And I remember in the seventh grade, we had a uh, a period where we didn't have uh, basketball practice. And we didn't have any other classes. And we were going to, our, our school didn't even have a track team. And uh, 
I said, and they said, well, those of you that want to run track, we've got an extra period. You don't have to go to study hall. You can go to track. And I thought, man, I can run like the wind. I, I heard all my life how my mom and my dad told me I was fast. I'm going to join track. And so I did, and we showed up for track, and there's that fat boy at track. And I'm like, you talking about sticking out like a sore thumb. He couldn't run from here to the bathroom unless it was real bad. And you know what? I said, uh, I said well, it's time for us to run. And I felt like this because I felt like I know how he feels because I feel like I don't belong every day when I get off the bus. I feel like I don't belong here. I don't look like they look. I don't act like they act. I don't feel like I belong here. And I know he doesn't feel like he belongs. And I said, come on, Kendall, go running with me. And I, st I ran real slow. And the next day I ran real slow. And today he's one of the skinniest guys I know. He just retired from the U.S. Army as the youngest two-star general in the U.S. Army. He was at church sitting on the platform with me. And he'll tell you that when we were in the seventh grade that I started him on the road to physical fitness because I was just kind to him. And he and I are inseparable. We'll be friends till the day one of us goes on to see Jesus because of something that happened in the seventh grade. And you can't believe by looking at him, he doesn't weigh 160 pounds. He weighed a lot more than that in the third grade. So we can just love one another, can't we? We can just serve one another, can't we? We can do better, can't we? And let's stand together. If you do this, you are. You, you, you're not going into, you're not going to a revival. But if you love one another and you do it this way and you pass this test, you are a revival. Wherever you go, people follow you. Wherever you go, people want to be like you. Wherever you go, that's where the Spirit of the Lord is. And so let us be filled. And I know, I know it's a holiday weekend, and I know it's not a lot of folks here, but I really feel like that somebody needs today to realize the most important thing that you can do for me is love me. And the most important thing that I can do for you is love you. Everything else flows out of that. It's the glue that holds us all together. And I, I want this church to be filled with the love of the Lord. Can I get a witness this morning? Let's give the Lord a big hand clap of praise this morning. Thank the Lord. Thank the Lord. God bless you. We start every worship service with family time. We're going to take about five minutes here. Greet all of our folks. that are, we got some guests here today. Let them know we're glad to have them. And we'll get started with an awesome worship service here in about five minutes.